How are you, Otto? How are you, Professor Maturana? Thank you for joining us in this conversation. Thank you for inviting. I am very happy to have accepted and being able to have a conversation with Otto. Beautiful. And you, Otto? Thank you also from my end. It's a great uh, honor for me to be part of this conversation with Umberto and with you and part of your series. It's so much needed at this point. the main topic that I would like to share in this conversation comes from a distinction. Humanity is experiencing a crisis. It is a human crisis that we can see in symptoms in different levels in the environment, the coronavirus, the financial crisis, many different things that are showing that the way in which we have been living have created the consequences that we are experiencing now. On your perspective, Professor Madurana, how do we know the present that we are experiencing? Well, the crisis in the human domain is a, a conflict of the purposes, a conflict a confr confronting desires, and one has to act either choosing one or the other or jumping to a domain of expansion of reflection which contains both in a space in which they are not conflict unless one, one wants one to predominate on the other. If we manage to do that, we can make a choice which is different from following one or the other as uh, the guiding idea, but generating a new vision of what action one should uh, take, which take place outside the conflict, in a new orientation of what one wants. Mm. And, and, and that orientation of what one wants, Otto, where, where do you think that we position ourselves ourselves to, to see that? So I, I want to start with kind of uh, what really resonates um, with me, Umberto, what you just said is the, um, the conflict of uh, uh, purposes and that um, we are in a situation kind of where we have or can make a choice and uh, that it is a choice really about uh, the future that we, we want to live in and we want to collectively enact. And um, so my view of um, seeing or looking at the current crisis, right, uh, Sebastian, your, your question, your opening question is that we live in a profound moment of disruption, right? You mentioned Corona and COVID, which is really a disruption on the level of the mind, where we become aware of the interdependency between all human beings and between all living beings really on earth. So that's, um, that is kind of one story that has been unfolding, but over the past two or three weeks, at least here in the United States, we have seen a much, a second part of the disruption, which is not only on the level of opening our mind, on the level of the collective, but which has to do with opening our hearts. And the killing and murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, and the, through, through a policeman who kneeled Nine, nine minutes, almost eight minutes and 46 seconds on his neck, uh, on the neck of an African-American man, sparked a global uprising, 
that I believe is a watershed in this century because uh, is it makes us aware of a blind spot that we have had, how we have organized institutions, how we have organized societies. And when I um, think back, so in my life, uh, I um, was a young activist in Germany, in Europe, um, in Western Germany and also Eastern Germany. And when uh, in 1989, we saw the collapse of the Berlin Wall, which effectively ended the um, Cold War system, right? That shaped the 20th century. And that was a conflict between one social system and another one, right? Capitalism versus kind of the, um, what was called socialism. But today, we are like, we see the other shoe drop, which is a disruption where we see the collapse of a wall, but it's not a wall between two systems, right? Out there in Berlin or some other places. It's a wall between myself and the system. It's between how I relate to other human beings, how I relate to the rest of society. And that's what's happening right now. And that's where COVID, right, was kind of the first blind spot, kind of where we begin to, uh, you know, the, the, the first blind spot. When I look at my own, you know, my own awakening in that, I think the first blind spot has to do with uh, ignorance. It has to do with seeing what's going on. And in terms of the violence here, for example, in America, the violence of policemen against African-American women and men. So that's something that we have closed the eyes towards for too long. And it really has a history of 401 years, a history of lynching and a history of slavery and everything connected with that. Um, the second opening that we see. So when we see kind of the collapse between the wall between self and system. So the first one has to do with ignorance and learning how to see. The second opening has to do with the collapse uh, between how we feel and how kind of um, whether what I see with my eyes, whether I also feel it, whether I can empathize with what's going on. So for example, in my case, I was aware of all the structural violence, right? The appalling uh, inequality, levels of inequality between the African American community uh, and uh, the rest of the population here in America, for example. But, so I was aware of that, but did I really act on that? Did I really kind of uh, empathize with that? I think there was too much of an emotional distancing and that wall that you know kept my heart closed towards this phenomenon just broke up with what's going on right now and you see it in on the streets around the world particularly young people a new group a new coalition is showing up that is no longer accepting these levels of inequality and is going to reshape uh, not only this country, but you know the, 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 what's what's going on in many other countries uh, as well. And on the third level, right? So that's the second blind spot: seeing something but not feeling it. And the third blind spot, I believe, is seeing something, feeling it, but not doing anything about it. So it's um, apathy. It's the condition of apathy. So that I feel, I empathize, but I'm not mobilizing my own resources to uh, you know, activate agency on the level of the individual and on the level of the collective. So those are two important points where I think that the boundary, I think it's a part of this century story that we see the boundary between self and system collapse and it has to do with opening the mind, opening the heart and opening the will or kind of uh, mobilizing our resources of doing something. My reflection has been for um, a long time prior to that, 
to feel that there is in many parts of the world, depending on their history, is much more evident a discrimination, a feeling of discrimination. Good, bad, white, black, Indian, not Indian, Aboriginal, invader, all that. And each one supported in some way, intimate, unconsciously, but consciously in the background, by a theory that validates discrimination. Every discrimination is supported by a theory that validates the negation of the other. Of whatever discrimination by color, by age, by sex, by, by whatever it is, if you ask the person, why you do that? Why you discriminate, even if you don't? And use the word discrimination, why do you do that? And the person will always answer with a theory that justifies the negation of love. One may not be aware consciously, but deeply one feels that one has to justify. That means that one knows that one was making a discrimination. No? and justifies with a theory. Because history, because sex, because whatever it is, is a history. So for me, I have been trying to find out how to eliminate certain theories. But how? With a new theory. <laughs> because the problem with theories is that are, they are logical but founded on certain premises accepted a priori. Why do I accept those premises that justify such negation of the other? Can I have a theory? I think that a theory will not be adequate because I will have to justify the, the new theory. So it requires, I think, a jump out, something completely new, an encounter in which, which is not based on theory. And what is a, what kind of encounter that is not based in theory is a friendship, the desire of living together. How come that we want to live with, with the other? Oh, because when we encounter in a, some space in which the seeing the other touches us in, in, in a deep way because it's another. Because somehow my emotions appear. So it's not a rational decision, it's emotional. Sometimes we, we see in, the, in, in meetings, for example, that there is discussion of different visions, positions, uh, but the, the moment comes in which there is an, an interruption. Uh, let us rest for about uh, 15 minutes, and then we go to have a coffee. And in coffee, we talk, but we happen to be something which has no theory. I mean, here, let us rest, let us have a coffee. And this process of having the coffee opens a conversation. And that is uh, the opportunity. Something of doing together which does not require theory. But in living must be a purpose. We must want to live together. We have to have this, a purpose of acting, very fundamental, grounded on our fundamental biological history. If we are having a coffee, 
we are relaxing, we are talking about anything, we listen to the voice of the other, uh, and if the other is just having coffee with us, we are beginning to live together and we can speak about that without the theory one say, well, uh, maybe we have to invent a way of being pleasant together. Well, the first invention was having a coffee. <laughs> the invitation to have a coffee invented the space of reflection. With Jimena have been thinking about the fundament for creating a space in which we can encounter ourselves doing something together because we want to do it together. And we can talk about how we do that that we would like to do. And that would be ideally what we call democracy. But we must handle democracy not with a theory, but with reflection. A reflection about ourselves and about our desires. Biological, that we had as children. The children's play share unless a theory gets into. Uh, for example, I have noticed that if um, a child five years old is having a birthday and uh, in, in the family invites the friends to to have a juice, to play in the garden on a little, in the square together, and the mother in some moment says, children, the juice is ready, come. And the children come running, and when they arrive, the mother says, who came first? And with that question, she introduces competition. We live a culture that stands on being better than the other. So we have to accept that we want to be with the other. So it's not a matter of being better. We won't be the other. Talk about what things to do in the desire of, of being honest because we want to be together. We want to do certain things. Without introducing a, a talk of who is first, who better, without that. And uh, what supports the do not entering into the path of competition is honesty. So we think that honesty in a domain in which we want to be together, in mutual respect, because we are not pretending that one is better than the other, is the fundament for the coming out of all social conflicts. If you do not want to be together, we better separate. If being together, I make a lie, I am being dishonest. Honesty is not, that, not lying. So simple. Mutual respect, just not making discrimination because we want to be together. So this is our problem. How we grow in a way in which we do not learn from the childhood theories that justify discrimination. It's not easy, because we live a culture centered on discrimination and competition. If we understand that, then we shall act accordingly. We say that when one understands the situation and has access to the adequate action and does not do it, either is stupid or malevolent. Thank you, Dr. Otto. We have many elements. And what do you think are the main elements that he presented that resonate with you? Many. So uh, the, the first one, of course, uh, uh, that you mentioned, Umberto, is um, uh, the um, discrimination, right? That this is a universal phenomenon kind of that we find in um, to different degrees, of course, right, in societies and countries around the world. So, um, 
systemic racism, right? Is kind of the, you know, a car, so one way, one way to, to speak about that, but it has many faces and many dimensions. And then uh, that you kind of went to the next layer, kind of what is the theory uh, kind of that is um, legitimizing this kind of uh, uh, behavior. And what I reminded, uh, and then kind of uh, uh, on the third layer that you, you presented, kind of exploring kind of the deeper realm kind of of what may help us to, to reshape, rethink, and reframe these theories. What's kind of the, um, and you talked about friendship, you talked about uh, honesty and um, uh, mutual respect. Um, so one thing comes to, to my mind and maybe uh, then you know i have a question that i want to pose to you in regard to this third level the deepest level the distinction that comes to my mind when listening to you umberto is a distinction by the peace researcher uh, johann galtung one of the founder of uh, a peace research as a science and uh, he is also the author uh, of the concept of structural violence so, and in his, um, so he came up with a distinction between three levels of violence, which is number one, of course, we know there's direct violence, right? So that, for example, here in America, that ha has been the policeman kind of who put his neck for almost nine minutes on the neck of an African-American man. So that was the killing of the murder of uh, George Floyd. Uh, three weeks ago. So that's an instance of direct violence. Um, the second form of violence, he says, is structural violence. And he realized that concept when visiting India and being on, on the roof there and seeing the suffering going on, even though there was no policeman around who puts his knee on some other person's neck. And he asked himself, so there is this suffering and dying, but not a single person as a perpetrator. Who is the perpetrator? It's the structure. It's the economic structure. It's the structure of inequality. So that's how he came up with the concept of structural violence, where you have victims, where you have suffering, but it's not a single individual who is the perpetrator. And then the third dimension of violence, according to Galtung, is cultural violence. And cultural violence is uh, basically what, what you outlined earlier, which is everything that is legitimizing that behavior. So you talked about theories that are legitimizing kind of this kind of behavior that is then enacting structural violence and direct violence. So that's just kind of this distinction um, came to my mind uh, while listening to you. And um, we, I think we all agree to really make progress on the first two levels of violence, direct and structural. We have to address the third form of violence, uh, which is cultural, as you uh, pointed out. Um, and um, what my reflection is on that is I always thought there is a fourth form of violence, which is attentional violence. And attentional violence is not seeing another person in terms of who she or he really is. So attentional violence is not seeing. Not seeing someone else in terms of his or her highest future capacities. And uh, that attentional violence, of course, is um, very much at the root here also of the problems in America, because, uh, you know, for example, when you see kind of the unequal access to educational opportunity and, and, and so forth. Um, but it also, I think, speaks to what, what you were talking about and also what you and uh, him and I were talking about when we had recently kind of our, our, uh, the earlier uh, conversation. So um, being seen really as something that, um, that allows us uh, to uh, 
step into the deeper level of our humanity. So the question that, that I would have to you is uh, on this kind of deeper level, kind of the enabling level. So not, as you said, not the theory level in, in your distinction, but, but the next uh, deeper level. What have you and Rimena and, uh, and the Institute Matrizica, what have you found out what can be really helpful? So for example, we in the Presencing Institute, we found that the social arts, social art practices, are critical for creating these healing environments that allows us to deal with individual and collective trauma, that allows us to, to, uh, to grow together, which became separate and, and fragmented um, through experiences of the past. But I wonder, um, what is it kind of in, in your work, that, that, that in, in, in Jimena's work and in the Institute's work, what you have found can be really helpful to make progress on that third level that you um, um, laid out to us. What uh, <clears throat> we have found with Jimena and the collaborators in, in Matristica is that uh, understanding the kind of being that we are as human beings is fundamental. If we understand how we are born and transformed as molecular systems, if we understand that we explain the world that we live with our doings, then, then you discover that uh, you are not different from the other. But you also discover that you can choose. And you will choose from your understanding the nature of humanness. The baby is born in trust, and the mother. The father, the, the family, takes it and takes care of it or rejects it and attempts to educate the banding particular behavior. There are two situations in, like, in which uh, this is, appears as very important. One was a study done in, by some psychologists in uh, Peru asking the question, what must have happened. Interesting question. Huh? What must have happened so that some young people that lives in this periphery uh, community is very poor, some come out of it and enter a world of uh, honesty and respect and collaboration, and others do not. And the answer was, if there is an adult that trusts the young person, listens to it and talks with it in conversation, this person will get out of the trap of the periphery. What Jimena found is, and she mentioned it, not directly when she said, that she had discovered that all pain for which one asks relational help is always of cultural origin. The way out is recovering self-respect. It's fantastic. So simple, recovering self-respect. The question is, how do you recover self-respect? And what she found is that the person would recover her respect if she managed to encounter an adult, a consultant, psychology, whoever it may be, that can listen to her without judgment and opens a space of reflection. And this person will discover that that pain that she or he was conserving, which imp Im implied the, uh, a self-devaluation because she, she was accused of being this or that culturally, not being able, not being intelligent or whatever it is. And she carried this belief as a self-devaluation. But in the moment in which this other person appears and she discover or he discover, it's not true. 
the self devaluation that he had not had no support was not valid and recover self respect hmm? so what we think is that we could manage to bring up the children but to encounter a person in the pace of conversation in which he or she recovers self-respect. Hmm? Self-respect is fundamental. If she recovers self-respect, will recover autonomy. And as he or she recovers autonomy, recover the capacity to choose. And will choose. Thank you very much, uh, Umberto, for your reflection. I will just would like to remind our audience that we are in this amazing and privileged conversation with Professor Umberto Madurana and Otto Scharmer. And Otto, from what Umberto was mentioning, how does it resonate with the experience you've had? Well, it resonates a lot um, uh, on uh, two levels. One is my own life, when I think back. Um, so you said um, really the key leverage point on that deeper level is do you have somebody, an adult uh, that is trusting you, right? And I had the, the benefit, I, I studied in a, in a really a new, newly opened university. There was nothing other than one, one inspiring teacher who trusted his students, right? He trusted us. That is so empowering, right? That is like all you need. That's all you need, right? When somebody is really, truly believing in you, that you can make mountains move. And we did. So um, I experienced that 100% in my own life, uh, what you described. And um, right now, when you say in my work, right? I mean, I think what, what I'm seeing, uh, what we are experiencing is that this is a truly a really universal a phenomenon. So, uh, for example, in ULAP, which is, and so I would maybe suggest uh, that it could be reframed slightly because in my, my life, it, it's true. It was like a, an adult that believed in me. That was transformative. Um, but uh, what we experienced in, for example, ULAP, which is an online platform where we, you know, share methods and tools that, you know, allow people to create their own learning communities and then go through processes. And what we learned there is that for many, like about a third of them who do that, it's life changing, right? And it's like many more who say it's eye opening or something. And when you double click on that and say, wait, wait a minute, how is that possible? It's something online and why is that life changing? You double click on that. And what you find is exactly what you described, which is a social environment of deep listening. You said at the root of it is uh, listening without judgment, right? So what we call listening with your mind and heart wide open. So listening not only here, but you know, listening from the, from the heart and um, making uh, really the boundary uh, between us uh, collapse. So what we found is that in these circles, if you can give practices where two conditions are met, all right? One is zero judgment, as you said, right? There is no judgment and no cynicism, right? No emotional distancing. And so that's kind of element one that you need, deep listening, right? Or as you said, listening without judgment. And the other element is uh, vulnerability, right? you need uh you know when you share you need to be willing to go to the edge so that's kind of courage and you know uh, uh vulnerability so if those two conditions are met the social field right is dropping to a deeper level and is doing exactly what you describe which is kind of connecting with our deeper level of humanness and and humanity and and, and creativity with uh, who we really are so that's so it's it's really uh, confirming what you say, um, and the the only modification I think uh, is that we also saw it um, that it can be a peer phenomenon. So when you form a circle of deep listening, an intentional community, 
and you develop circle practices, the same thing that you describe between a student and uh, an educator can also happen there, we believe. A question that I would have for you, Umberto, is because we live in a moment, right, with the COVID-19 moment. So everything is, I mean, the schools were, you know, already in not good shape before, right? Colleges and universities, as we, as we all know. Now, it's even much worse, right? So now it's kind of everything is going online. And the poor kind of college kids with their parents at home and getting just the intellectual content transferred uh, online. So what does that do to uh, the true learning process that we are, we are both interested in? What is your view on that? And, and what is it maybe we should be doing in this moment where we all live in this uh, collective crisis where we, on the one hand, see young people at the forefront of a global uprising, right? A movement that is about to reimagine and reshape our civilization, the way we live and work. And on the other hand, mental health issues we have never seen before, right? Uh, you know, uh, symptoms of um, depression and anxiety disorder, and now, uh, even kind of the on-campus experience taking away from students and, and put into an online learning environment that combined with Facebook makes everyone even more depressed. We are equal in the conducts that we have to perform to avoid the expansion of the virus. But the way we talk about it is delicate. For example, we have to keep a distance. Is a social distance or space distance? It's a space distance, it's not a social distance. It's a social integration in a space distance. It's completely different. So we have to, to choose a way of, of talking which continues to validate that we are constituting a community in the qual, if we coordinate our behaviors in a certain manner, that do not destroy our sociality, our unity, but manipulate the space, but it will be much easier. But if we speak, we have to keep social distance. Is it not understood? How am I going to keep a social distance with my brother? I cannot, but, but I can keep a space distance, one meter or whatever, huh? but not call it social distance. So uh, the situation uh, is uh, in that way, if we see it properly, is showing us that we constitute a humanity. We are all participants in the creation of the world that we are living and that we will live. Before moving forward to this in huge and important topic, which is this recognition of us humanity as one, I would like to also um, uh, make a double click in what Otto was um, inviting and proposing as a reflection. I have heard you and Jimena many times mention that children are not the future of mankind, but the adults with whom they transform in their daily living. And nowadays, yes. this great opportunity of transformation, what yes. are your insights and your perspective around how education can take this opportunity as an actual opportunity for transformation? Well, first of all, speak no more about social distance. That's no. clear. <laughs> this is the first thing. If we are not speaking about social distance, we are speaking of encountering in conversations. And conversations uh, is living together, is doing things together. It's not like a dialogue, and the dialogue 
we go through the reasons. It is a confrontation of, of reasons. So expand the space of conversation. Listen to the children's question. Explain the difficulty, the difficulties that the children encounter, the students encounter in certain situations are great gifts because they show to you where the difficulty is, where the expansion of the reflection must take place. It is not in uh, education a matter of uh, getting better. The, the mark the, that one puts, do not classify better and worst. Show the place where further reflections are necessary. So we must change our discourse, accept that every human being can learn to do whatever other human being does, and that this is an opportunity for conversation. Conversation as we are having through the internet, uh, conversation by phone, talking about the difficulties that one has in understanding something, because the students that fail show that the teachers failed, because the teachers did not discover where was the difficulty that the children had or the student had. Hmm? So in a way, it's simple, but it is not so simple because it requires for the adults to have the attitude of listening and conversing and reflecting in a new space in which the space nearness is uh, a desire of listening. Hmm? Thank you, thank you, Umberto, for your reflection. And we are getting near to the end of our conversation, but I didn't want to let go of this fundamental element that Umberto was mentioning about this recognition of us, humanity as one. And from, from your perspective, Otto, how does that resonate with the vision that you are also inviting uh, people to see? and understand. Well, I would like to, to, to combine that with the, uh, the, the, uh, the second last question you ask, uh, which is the, the future of education, right? What, what is that current moment? And I would, um, what, Umberto, what you said very much uh, resonated uh, with me. And my way of articulating that would be, so particularly your first principle, no more social distance, right? Um, and uh, the way I would describe, I think it goes back really to the beginning of our conversation um, when um, uh, you talked about the choice, the collective choices also, so that, that, that we are um, uh, uh, maybe able to make. So what I would say is what we are in in this decade and in this century is in a situation that um, we, that is calling for massive levels of transformation, basically on all levels of our civilization and our society, globally, regionally, and locally. And what's not there is transformation literacy. So what's not there, particularly vertical transformation literacy, which is the capacity to see, to open the eyes, to really connect, the capacity to sense, to kind of to bring down the walls that separates us on the level of our hearts, and the capacity to move, to activate our agency, which really is the capacity to let go and let come. And I think what schools, why we have schools is to, to create these holding spaces where that can be... Um, that can be practiced. And that's where, uh, where we see a, a huge uh, lack of uh, at this point, and that's what we need to make available much more widely. So it has to do with holding spaces that allow us to engage in these practices. It is deep listening. It has to do with collective dialogue and holding spaces 
uh, but it also has to do with really new ways of organizing, finding new ways of more distributed and more dialogic and more uh, ways of organizing and, and, and uh, governing larger systems that are based on awareness-based systems change, not just on external mechanisms that are imposed on people. So that's what I feel. And um, I was, in terms of the global, I think we live very much uh, in an age where in order to move the dial to, uh, locally, we need a global web of connections and co-inspiration and support. And in order to affect change on the level, on, on the global level, which is so much necessary today, we need to be grounded and rooted in, in, in our local activities. So I very much believe in that. And we had um, an, one, an Aboriginal leader from Canada in our Gaia session yesterday, she, who talked about the eighth prophecy, kind of so that uh, you know, from her tradition of indigenous wisdom and the eighth fire, uh, our prophecy was about really all the different races, all the different cultures from all the different directions coming together and offering their gifts and beginning to collaborate, uh, you know, towards uh, a higher purpose. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of how in her tradition, this kind of um, aspiration has been articulated. But I truly feel that it is alive in, in many people's hearts right now, but it's not yet fully activated. And that's pretty much what, uh, what we need to do and what we need to create environments for, for all of us, but particularly also for young people. I would like to reflect, I like what you have said, but you use two words that I would like to reflect a little bit, change and transformation. These two words have completely different meanings although they seem to be pointing to the same thing, but transformation entails something that is conserved. Transformation is changes around something that is conserved. Change entails complete going in another direction. And what we need is transformation. But for, for transformation, we need to think in what we want to conserve. So if we manage to have clear what we want to conserve, everything else will change around that. We have uh, in Matristica a systemic law, which says, whenever in a collection of elements in a system, certain configuration of relations begins to be conserved. A space is open for everything else to change around the con configuration of relation that is being conserved. So a real question is, what do we want to conserve? I, I very much agree with that. And I, I wonder, Umberto, how, how would you answer that question? So what is, from, from your point of view, the most important thing we need to conserve? Honesty and mutual respect. It's the only thing that will create a space for the arising of collaboration. In a space of conversations. And if I may jump in. Otto, mm -hmm. what do you think that it will be the important things for us to conserve? Certainly honesty and mutual respect. I also think uh, our capacity to love and connect with beauty. And I also feel that so we as human beings, as a human species, 
we are like really work in progress, right? We are only like uh, half here, so to speak, right? So in other words, we <laughs> yes. have a dor dormant potential, right? That maybe when we are lucky, we can activate a little bit. So I don't know what, the, what words to put around that, but that's why I think kind of um, social arts and also the letting go and letting come, kind of leaning into that, what is dormant at this point, but what can be activated. That's another aspect that relates for me to the essence of humanity. So if, if you want, what, what is it we need to, 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 to conserve, to protect? It's the essence of our humanity. Mm. Uh, it's interesting because all these reflections intercross to see I must not have a theory or expectations. I must let appear that is what is the situation in which I am. And we think that love, we in Matristica think that love is letting appear. And then you see, we choose after, but you choose something that is not distorted by a theory, by an expectation, by a demand. It's simple, and at the same time, sometimes because we have too many theories, not easy. Love is letting appear. I think that is a... wonderful summary of, of our uh, conversation. <laughs> and, and at the same time, it maybe also is the headline of uh, yet another conversation that many of us can have, which is how to decipher that, how to, uh, if love is letting appear, how is it that we develop practices uh, on all levels of our social relationships that allow us to, to activate the dormant potential for that, yeah. uh, even a lot more than what we see right now. Yes. If we think about it and see what it is, for example, a scientist, what is the most fundamental attitude of the scientist? Letting it appear. Because you do not see the experience you want to understand. In the reflection, something appears and I want to understand more. I have to expand my letting appear <laughs> in the reflection. Hmm? So you are right, you synthesize it very well. Thank you, Professor Magdalena. Thank you, Otto. And talking about letting appear, I would also would love to let appear a message to the audience that is watching this conversation from all different places in the planet, different uh, practices and professions that they might have. What for each one of you would be a message or a reflection that you would like to share to this larger audience in order for them to reflect about what could their role be in this movement of transformation, in this moment of transition? What invitation would you make this larger audience in order to raise awareness and move towards action? I laugh because uh, I would think in the following sentence. We human beings are the problem. We human beings are the path for dissolving this problem. We human beings are the solution. But we have to want it. Let appear the community that we integrate in mutual respect and honesty. Otto, 
a message, a synthesis, a reflection for the larger audience that is watching this conversation? I would say this is the time to stop, to see, to sense, to reflect on what begins to appear for us as individuals, but also collectively. There has never been a generation on earth before whose uh, decision about what to do or not to do has such a profound impact on the future of the planet. So we are very privileged to be alive on this planet right now. And the challenge we all face is to connect to our deeper sources of knowing. So two or three suggestions that I would have is number one, develop a practice, something, what is a practice? It's something you do every day that allows you to connect, you know, to move into an intentional stillness where you tune out the noise and connect with that what's most essential for you. There are many forms of doing that. Pick the one that works for you. Number two, form a circle. Find one, two, three, four other people that you can engage in deep listening practices with along the lines of what Umberto and I discussed earlier, where we really begin to see each other with our mind and heart wide open in terms of who we really are. And the third one is follow your heart. Your heart already knows. And as you as we live in a moment of disruption, it means that all the external sources of knowledge and navigation instruments tend to not work. So what are we left with? We are left with our networks, our friends, and our heart. So your heart already knows as you investigate your own step forward, kind of uh, your own journey forward, always listen to the knowing of your heart. Do what you love and love what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Maturana. Thank you, Otto. These last reflections that you share with us resonate deeply and profoundly to all of us who are collaborating, practicing, and doing in actually creating this same project for a livable future, in connecting with each other from our heart, connecting in our purpose, of being a contribution for this moment of transformation and inviting you, the larger audience that is watching us, to join this movement. Because if we come into this awareness that we are one humanity and that, as Umberto mentioned as well, we are the problem, we are the path, and we are also the solution, if we engage in our radical processes of collaboration, we can transform the present that we are living towards generating a livable future for us all. Thank you very much, Professor Humberto Madurana. Thank you very much, Otto. And thank you for staying in this conversation and joining us in this reflexive journey.